Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Melita Terry. I am the Senior Community Engagement Coordinator at the Alzheimer's Disease Research Center. We are so delighted uh, to bring to you the Walter Allen Memorial Community Lecture. Before we get started, I would like to give you some background on the Walter Allen Memorial Community Lecture. This series is named of honor of Walter Allen, a prominent African-American photographer who worked for the New Pittsburgh Courier in the 1950s and 1960s and later died with dementia. The University of Pittsburgh Alzheimer's Disease Research Center has presented over the past several years, the Walter Allen Memorial Community Lecture in the Historical Hill District. The series offers a platform that brings researchers and clinical experts to community settings, creating interactive and educational programs on Alzheimer's disease and other related dementias relevant to the African-American community. Today, we are honored to have with us the daughter of Walter Allen, Miss Dorothy Allen Merchant. I'm happy to be here. I didn't know that I was getting such prominent billing. <laughs> Yes, absolutely, absolutely. We, we are just so honored and excited. When I got the email uh, from you, I was just so elated um, that we would actually have you present with us today. So it's such an honor. And if you wouldn't mind taking a few moments to um, speak with the audience about your father and um, any other sentiments that you would like to share, it would be greatly appreciated. Well, um, my dad was born um, in 1915 and he died in 2000 at the age of 85. So if he were alive today, he'd be 107 years old. Um, as you mentioned, he um, was a photographer and um, I have many happy childhood memories. I especially recall going to um, the Courier when he worked there. And it was before the 50s and the 60s because I was little, but um, at any rate, I love to watch the presses roll, um, that they had a, a huge glass window that was from floor to ceiling glass and these humongous rolls of paper. And when the press started, the whole building seemed to shake. And then they would go whizzing by and at the other end would come out a newspaper. And I was just fascinated by that. And then we would go sometimes to lunch at the YMCA across the street and, um, in the Teeny Harris collection, there's a picture that Teeny Harris took of my dad sitting at the counter of the Y across the street. Sometimes we'd go to movies at the Granada show. Sometimes we'd catch the streetcar and sometimes we'd walk and I'd hold his hand and go skipping down the street and was just happy. But the best memory of all was when we'd go to the library because my dad was just a voracious reader. He read all the time and passed that love of reading on to me. Um, he loved a good discussion, a debate, and he was very well informed because he read so much. Um, so he told me one time about these long discussions he used to have with a certain young man, and um, they talked about lots of things and they talked often. And I later got to meet the, the young man who was by this time an adult. And I approached him and said, my dad says that he knows you. And he said, well, who was your dad? And I told him Walter Allen. And his response was, which daughter are you? So that he clearly had talked about that with my dad and his name was August Wilson. <laughs> so he and my dad had had many long conversations. In later life, um, daddy became a community activist. He worked on the Hill District Library Advisory Board. He um, was one of the founding members of the Hill District Credit Union. Um, but around age 78 or so, he began to show signs of dementia. Um, he'd go in a room to pick up something and then have to come back and say, now, what was I looking for? Well, that in itself was not too alarming because we all do that, but not every day and not several times a day. So that was concerning. Um, then he, started wandering. He would just go off and we wouldn't know where he was. And he'd always seem to find his way back, but um, that was concerning. One day he just walked into some gentleman's house. So he was lucky he didn't get hurt, but we had already alerted the police and the police, um, when the man called the police and said, this strange man is 
he's elderly and he's confused. Um, so we got him home that time. Um, the, the, one of the really alarming things was I had him in the car one day and we were driving down Center Avenue, a street he had gone up and down for 60 years. And he looks out the car window and says, hmm, I've never been on this street before. So we knew that um, there were some serious issues, uh, but the, the, the probably crowning one is he left the house with his camera one day and came back without it. So he said, what did you do with your camera? Um, and he said, he gave it to some man. And so he said, well, where? So my husband took him back, you know, down where we thought he might be. We never found the man, we never found the camera. So at that point we knew um, that he was in serious trouble. He later had difficulty dressing himself and finally he didn't even recognize the family. I went to visit him. Um, we had to put him at a nursing home and um, I said, uh, Daddy, do you know who I am? And he looks at me and he says, of course I know who you are. And I said, who am I? And he said, the lady who works here. <laughs> so <laughs> we found some humor in his situation even in the midst of it. Um, you may have a bonus, uh, Miss Terry, because my sister may also be on this call. So you're just getting a, a, you know, double blessings and maybe even a cousin or two may be here. So um, I'm in the process of honoring my dad's memory by putting together a collection of his photographs. He um, took pictures of Pittsburgh and people in Pittsburgh for 50 years um, from the 1940s to the 1990s, late 89s, 90s. So I would just like to thank you and the Alzheimer's Disease Research um, Center for memorializing my dad in this way. And uh, we're very grateful and very thankful. Thank you so much. No, thank you so much. And thank you so much for um, giving us a really close and more personal um, view of your dad. That, that was wonderful. I, I, I'm just so honored. And if your um, additional family members are here, um, we, we are so grateful to be honoring one of your family members here with us. Um, this is something that is very, very um, near and dear to our center. And it, it was something that the community can relate to. So thank you so much for sharing. My pleasure. Next, we will have uh, Dr. Beth Shaban, who was one of our ORCOR uh, leadership team members who will uh, introduce our featured speaker today, Hi, everybody. I just want to welcome you to our Walter Allen Lecture Series, and I'm so pleased to see a great turnout um, to this uh, really exciting webinar where we're going to learn some really interesting information from Dr. Stillman. First, I just want to echo uh, Ms. Terry and thank Ms. Merchant so much for coming um, in person and joining this lecture series. We want to extend a sincere thank you uh, directly from the full executive committee team of the Alzheimer Disease Research Center. Now today, it's my great honor to introduce to you Dr. Stillman. Dr. Chelsea Stillman is a research assistant professor of psychology here at the University of Pittsburgh. She obtained her PhD from Georgetown University, and then she completed a postdoctoral fellowship at um, in geriatric psychiatry prior to joining the psychology faculty. Her research focuses on uncovering the mechanisms by which physical activity and other modifiable health factors promote neurocognitive health, as well as developing scalable strategies to promote adoption and maintenance of good health behaviors in populations who are at increased risk of cognitive decline. So we're really excited to have her here. Um, we're ready to hear about how we can promote healthy brain aging with the goal of preventing cognitive decline. Dr. Stillman, take it away. Thanks so much, Dr. Shaven. Thank you so much to the ADRC for uh, the invite. As Dr. Shaven mentioned, I'm going to be talking about healthy brain aging and uh, the promise that certain behaviors provide us for preserving our brain function in adulthood, which is obviously something we're all interested in. Um, given what we know about Alzheimer's. So I wanted to start by telling you a bit about my uh, research field, which is pretty new and a lot of people have not heard about it and it's called health neuroscience. So what this is, is it's a field that's a mashup of a bunch of uh, different disciplines. So health neuroscience combines 
uh, public health, we, we have tools and methods that we take from, we borrow, we, we steal from other disciplines like public health and psychology and neuroscience. And uh, what we're interested in is figuring out ways in which the health behaviors that we do impact our brain and then the opposite direction as well. So we really think of these relationships as bi-directional where the brain can also impact the behaviors that we engage in. So in thinking about the brain flexibly in this way, uh, I think can provide us some insights into um, how we uh, can treat Alzheimer's or how we can prevent it. There we go. Uh, so the field of health neuroscience has emerged at a at a really convenient time because as a world, we are aging. So this graph is showing, uh, you can see the lines are crossing here and we're already past this point where the number of older adults far outnumbers that of young children. And while this is a time we might be able to use this as an opportunity, this might be really beneficial in many respects, it's also gonna present some challenges. This shift in our age demographic um, and, and this is because many chronic and costly diseases, including Alzheimer's, increase in prevalence as we age. So to put this in perspective, currently we have 46 million older Americans today. So this increase in their, our age demographic is particularly prevalent in, in developed countries like the US. So here we have 46 million older Americans today, and that number is projected to almost double in just a couple of, a couple more decades. Currently, we are living with about 5 million Americans that have cognitive impairments. That represents, if you're trying to do the math in your head, about 11%. And by 2050, this percentage is gonna to increase to actually around 17 or 18%. So we'll have 14 million living with cognitive impairment. So obviously the sheer numbers, the sheer change in numbers in just a couple of decades is alarming. Um, and of course the number one type of cognitive impairment that Americans or adults experience as they age is Alzheimer's disease. So this is an irreversible currently brain disorder. It's progressive and it slowly destroys memory and thinking skills we typically see the onset of symptoms starting in the 60s, but um, your risk of cognitive impairment, particularly for Alzheimer's disease, increases exponentially as, as you age beyond this. And the symptoms you might be familiar with already include uh, memory problems, confusion, sudden trouble managing money or handling uh, daily tasks that you were once able to do without a problem, like handling bills. Uh, and as the disease progresses, so did the symptoms in terms of severity. So um, kind of in the mid stages of Alzheimer's, you might notice some disorganization, uh, poor judgment and impulse control. Um, so uh, going out and purchasing um, tons of things that you normally, you normally wouldn't, uh, personality and mood changes even. And then of course, in the more severe, the later stages of the disease, we see these more scary symptoms like seizures, uh, loss of bodily functions, and of course, malnutrition. So this obviously is a very scary disease. And what we're concerned about is not only the social implications of this, because obviously this puts a lot of stress and strain on family, uh, but also the costs of dementia. So to put this in perspective, if got to move your faces here for a second. Uh, it's covering my slides. Uh, if dementia care were a company, it would be the world's largest company in terms of annual revenue. So here um, on, the, on the horizontal axis here, we're pretending that dementia is a company and we're comparing it to Walmart and ExxonMobil, which globally are two of the highest grossing companies. And on the vertical axis is billions of dollars. So dementia, the cost of it in terms of medical care um, is about $600 billion annually, whereas the profits for these two massive companies are kind of pale in comparison to the cost of dementia. So with this context in mind, here are some guiding questions for the rest of my lecture today. So this first one here, um, I'm gonna talk about a major health disparity that we see in cognitive impairment, including, including Alzheimer's disease. And 
and then I'm going to tell you about how physical activity might be a promising, particularly promising behavior, because there are several that can preserve our cognitive functioning. And then I'm going to tell you a bit about some research that's currently underway um, in, in, our, in our research group here. So as this question alludes to the, the burden of Alzheimer's disease or the um, who experiences it is not equal across all older adults. What we know is that black Americans are two to three times more likely than whites to experience Alzheimer's disease or other dementias in their lifetime. So that is a staggering difference and it frankly is embarrassing in a developed country like this. So what we think, what we hypothesize might be behind this disparity is what we call the social determinants of health. So there might be a small portion that has to do with um, some genetic risk factors, but we think the majority of this is um, more environmental. So for example, these are the main social determinants that we think about. One is social context. So for example, we know in this country, there is a history of uh, systemic racism, which is stressful, causes stress. Um, and it also is associated with um, community isolation and this impacts our brain and cognitive health. It, uh, social determinants like access to healthcare. So there are definitely racial disparities in our access to quality healthcare and education. And all of these combine to uh, impact our economic stability. So our ability to purchase healthy foods, um, to live in safe areas, um, in, in built environment, um, access to safe places for physical activity is, is also considered a social determinant of health that could have big impacts for our risk of cognitive impairment as we age. So all of these social determinants of health that I mentioned, uh, I mentioned kind of the big buckets that we think about, we think, think that they impact our health by increasing our cardiometabolic risk profile. So what this means is uh, we think of cardiometabolic risk as kind of this constellation of a couple different things. So things like hypertension or blood pressure. So we know that black Americans as they age 72% have high blood pressure compared to just over 50% of older white adults. Um, obesity, so more than 50% of Black Americans, even adjusting for age, meet the criteria for obesity compared to a third of whites and other vascular diseases. In some ways, this is not terrible news because it's estimated that by the World Health Organization, so a really reputable organization, that one third of dementia cases are attributable to modifiable risk factors. So this means that intervention, so changing behaviors that target cardiometabolic health could have significant consequences on our brain and cognitive function too. So there are many strategies that we can do, we now know, to promote successful aging. And you can really think about these as an insurance policy the more of these boxes that you check, you can think of them as an insurance policy against dementia because they build something that we refer to as cognitive reserve. So cognitive reserve is, we think of it as kind of how much your brain can take before it starts to show the symptoms of pathology. So if you do a lot of healthy behaviors, you could have the gunk that we think of as causing Alzheimer's or potentially a uh, causing Alzheimer's, you could have a lot of gunk in your brain and you could still be performing normally because this is kind of a, uh, kind of uh, prevents you from showing your brain can withstand more before you start to show the, the symptoms of Alzheimer's. So to zoom in on these behaviors, these were taken from a recent Harvard Medical School publication. And these are the behaviors so far that have some evidence behind them for preserving and promoting brain function as we age. Uh, first, we can stay connected. We can stay socially connected and engaged to our friends and our family. We can engage in exercise, which I'll talk more about that in a moment. We can stay intellectually challenged and engaged. So you might have heard about these more cognitive type interventions like Sudoku and all those. So staying challenged seems to be really important. You can focus on having a healthy diet. 
getting enough rest and managing unwanted stress. So the behavior, the lifestyle behavior that by far has the most evidence behind it to date is exercise. And this is for a couple of reasons. So specifically when I say exercise, in my case, I'm talking about aerobic exercise and that is where the bulk of evidence in the research field lies. Um, and the reason why is because it's widely accessible. So most people can do aerobic exercise. It's very cost-effective. So uh, you don't need a ton of fancy equipment. You can just go out, put on your sneakers and walk. It's relatively easy to implement and monitor. So that means we can, we can study it. And it has broad systemic effects. So we know that engaging in exercise has effects pretty much on every organ system in the body. It's hard to imagine um, an organ that does not get affected in some way by exercise. Another reason why we focus on exercise is because physical inactivity actually accounts for a whopping a number of dementia cases. So it's estimated that nearly 13% of worldwide Alzheimer's cases are attributable to physical inactivity. And of course, in the US here, we're very sedentary and it's estimated that 21% of our Alzheimer's cases in the US are attributable to inactivity. And just a small reduction, so just perhaps a 10% reduction in physical inactivity could prevent 380,000 cases of Alzheimer's worldwide and almost 100,000 in just our country alone. So this is for this reason, uh, exercise or physical activity is a behavior that we've really zeroed in on as important to target in terms of um, our ability to prevent and preserve cognitive functioning. So can aerobic exercise preserve your neurocognitive functioning as you age? The answer to that seems to be an overwhelming yes. So here, I know this looks a little scary. <laughs> I'm presenting a graph from a large epidemiological study where they took nearly 2000 older adults and all they asked them at baseline was, how much do you work out? How much do you exercise? Was it greater than three times per week or was it under three times per week? And they followed them, so they, they asked and they assessed them for cognitive functioning. So they were all dementia-free at baseline and they assessed them every two years uh, throughout the rest of their life. And what they found was that, um, so this black line here is people that exercise more than three times or equal to three times per week. And they actually found that they were much older than the group that exercised less when they got dementia. So this is some of the first evidence that, hey, how much, you, how much physical activity you get is linked to when you get dementia. Uh, but of course, one limitation here for any scientist here is that there could be tons of other factors that differ, right, between the people that have greater than three times per week physical activity and those that are less active. So this is where randomized controlled trials come in. And we like, this is the gold standard in our field because we like to be able to say that something, something caused something else. So this randomization thing is very critical. Here's the design of a typical randomized controlled trial. So we will generally have older sedentary volunteers. They will complete a number of baseline assessments. So um, usually a fitness test, an MRI scan, uh, some thorough cognitive testing. And in some studies, we're now including a uh, blood draws so that we can look at some blood biomarkers like blood sugar and things like that. They're then randomized into one of two different groups, either a brisk walking group or a stretching and toning um, or some other control group. And what's interesting about these groups is that they're, they're selected very, very carefully for um, to be matched on a number of characteristics, but to differ in one very important way. So both groups here are receiving some type of physical activity. One is stretching and toning and the other is walking. Both groups are coming to the lab and receiving treatment in groups. And they're getting the same dose of, of attention, if you will. So they're coming three days per week for 30 to 45 minutes. So they're interacting with the trainers just as much. Uh, but the key difference between these groups here is in the intensity and the type of, of physical activity. 
And then they will do their group assignment for either six months or one year, depending on how long the study is. And then they will do all of the same assessments that they did at baseline again. And this design really allows us to test for um, whether the uh, brisk walking in this case, whether the aerobic activity causes changes in the outcomes that we care about. So do these types, these RCTs or randomized controlled trials, do they improve cognition? And the answer to this is absolutely yes, it seems to be. So here I'm showing a ton of different randomized controlled trials. So we're kind of pooling the effects, summarizing the effects of, um, across a bunch of studies using that design. And what we see is that there's a net next to this red arrow is that there's a net positive effect favoring those in the aerobic, in the aerobic group. So there tends to be about a 48% uh, increase in, in memory function in this case, in cognitively normal adults that participated in the exercise condition or the aerobic exercise condition compared to the control dish condition. And these effects seem to be stronger for certain types of cognitive skills than others. So for example, the effects are strongest. Well, you can see that the exercise groups in these studies tend to always perform better than the control groups. The effects are particularly strong for executive functions, things like um, kind of coordinating, multitasking um, in controlled processes like memory, and, and also some spatial, some spatial memory type, type functions. So you might be asking yourself, why, why, would, why would these effects be so specific to certain types of cognitive processes, which also, by the way, happen to be the first to go in, in normal aging as well as in early Alzheimer's disease. And so in our lab, we focus a lot on the mechanisms by which physical activity impacts our, our cognitive functioning. And in particular, we focus a lot on the neural the neural mechanisms, but there are a bunch of different levels of mechanisms that you could, you could think about. And our favorite brain region of all, the, of all the potential neural brain or neural regions is the hippocampus. And exercise researchers have focused on this, re, on this region for a few reasons. One is that the hippocampus plays a really central role in memory formation. So again, this is memory is uh, this process of this, this cognitive function that's one of the first to go in Alzheimer's disease. So uh, it makes sense that we would want to focus on a region that seems to be really central to memory. The deterioration in, in the structure of the hippocampus predicts conversion to Alzheimer's disease. So we can actually, if we see changes in the structure, the, the volume of the hippocampus pictured here in yellow, we can actually predict who might convert to Alzheimer's disease in a few years. And then finally, exercise unequivocally affects the hippocampus in, in rodent models. So, however, it wasn't until 2011 that we knew that exercise might also do the same thing to the human hippocampus. And this study by uh, my colleague, Kirk Erickson, was the first study to demonstrate this. So he took 120 cognitively normal, meaning dementia-free, sedentary older adults, and he randomly assigned them to either an aerobic walking group or a stretching and toning group for a whole year. And they did a number of baseline assessments before the intervention, and then they did the same assessments after the intervention, including um, a structural MRI in order to get, uh, to look at um, the volume of brain regions like the hippocampus. And here's what he found. So I'm gonna show a couple of these graphs. So I'll just orient you really quickly. So he did three MRI scans actually, one at baseline, one at six months after the, the groups had done six months of their classes, and then one at follow-up, so at one year. And the blue line is what you wanna pay attention to. That's the exercise group. And then the red line is the control group or the stretching group. So this is the thalamus. It's not a region that was particularly predicted to change following exercise. And it did, it did exactly what we thought, nothing. It kind of stayed the same in volume um, over the three time points. Next was, he looked at the caudate as well. Um, 
And what he found there was the same thing. There were no differences between the control and the, or the stretching and the exercise group um, over the course of the intervention. But he saw something very different when it came to this hippocampus region. In particular, uh, he, if you look at the, the two take homes here are that if you look at this red line, the controls, they actually decreased in volume in just a year. And while the exercise group, they not only maintain their volume, they actually increased in volume over, over that one year period. So the take home here is that the, the brain is remaining plastic um, and the hippocampus is actually growing. So it's not only just preventing exercise, not only just prevented age-related volume loss in the brain, it actually grew the brain, which I think is pretty cool. Since this study, uh, here's another one of these scary looking plots. Since this study, a number of other randomized controlled trials have looked at the volume of the hippocampus following an aerobic exercise intervention, actually all different types of exercise interventions, but, but mainly aerobic. And what we found here when we collapsed across all these studies, there was indeed a net positive effect. So the hippocampus does seem to get larger um, following these, these exercise interventions, which generally lasts no more than a year. So just a quick interim summary here. Physical inactivity is a significant risk factor for cognitive and brain decline. Black Americans are at highest risk of experiencing dementia compared to other, other racial groups. The brain remains modifiable throughout the lifespan and certain behaviors like physical activity can harness this plasticity. And exercise interventions, we have evidence that they can enhance neurocognitive functioning and brain integrity in older adults. So you might be asking yourself, sounds good, like we have everything we need, right? Uh, let's just go exercise. Um, well, there are some gaps in our existing exercise research, uh, which limit how much we can generalize the results of these studies to the broader population. So what we'd like to be able to do is provide an exercise prescription to people and tell them how much exercise you need to do, given your certain demographic characteristics uh, to, pre to preserve or increase your brain functioning. Right now, the evidence that we have is predominantly from white participants. The studies, of exercise are mostly center-based. And what I mean by that is it involves people coming to a campus like in Oakland here and working out in a laboratory facility um, set up as a gym with trainers right there. And most of them have used pretty boring forms of exercise like, like walking. So they're not particularly innovative and they're not particularly engaging. So we definitely still have some gaps in our understanding of how to best utilize physical activity. Here comes dance. So dance could potentially be a more innovative form of physical activity. It's highly enjoyable and engaging. We know that it's really effective at elevating heart rate. It improves mobility and balance and coordination and other things like mood, self-confidence and cognition. And in particular, one type of dance, in particular African dance, increases endurance. So is particularly aerobic because it involves uh, the whole body functioning um, as, as, different, as different units. And for this reason, it's particularly good at increasing heart rate and getting us into that aerobic zone where we can actually increase endurance. So this is a segue into the Rhythm Experience and Africana Culture Trial, which is um, how I'm gonna finish up um, my, my lecture today. So the REACT study is a study that started out as a small pilot. Um, and what we found in that pilot was that we saw weight loss in our African dance group. And we also found that people really loved doing this intervention. So. Um, we applied to the NIH, the National Institutes of Health, and we got a much bigger pot of money in order to take this intervention 
um, to a broader scale. So as I mentioned, this is an NIH funded clinical trial. We are comparing a dance group to a cultural immersion group. And the groups participate in classes for six months and they're supervised, they're led by trained instructors. And we are recruiting 180 African-Americans between ages 60 and 80. And we have two community sites here in, in Pittsburgh. Our pilot also had a site in Philadelphia, but for this study, we, um, we kept it really local to um, just Pittsburgh. I'm trying to find my mouse here. here we go. Our goal of the REACT study is to determine the impact of these two different interventions, the dance and the cultural immersion group on cognitive and brain functioning. So we have a number of eligibility criteria, which I won't go through. Um, I'm only putting this here to say that a lot of them are related to safety. Um, so we wanna make sure that people are safe to engage in physical activity before we enroll them. And that includes MRI safety. So because we were interested in looking at the brain, uh, we need to make sure that people are um, comfortable and medically able to be in an MRI. Here is our awesome team. Uh, we have a really, really skilled team. Uh, we have our first point of contact for the study when people call in uh, is, is Sam here. She's our recruiter. And we also have two wonderful study coordinators, uh, Miloti, who is actually on maternity leave. She had our first, um, actually our second uh, React baby. And uh, Gabby is filling in while she is on leave. So uh, these three are the first points of contact uh, when people see our ads and call into the study. We also have a fantastic assessment team. We have Hawa who does our cognitive assessments, Christine who does the fitness assessment and Jeff who uh, walks our participants through the MRI scan, which is very quick. And we also have our intervention team. So if anyone here is interested in joining the study, Chrysala and Ronnie are incredible and they kind of co-teach both the dance class and the cultural immersion classes. So here is what a general timeline of the study looks like. So participants are enrolled and they do baseline assessments over a period of about three or four weeks. So they uh, will do a cognitive assessment, a fitness, assessment and they'll be given a little Fitbit to wear for a week and then they do an MRI and uh, complete a blood draw which can happen after um, after they enter classes. Um, they are then randomized on, into either the dance or the cultural um, immersion group and then they do six months of classes on Monday, Wednesdays and Fridays. And then they do all the same assessments that they did at baseline, again, at follow-up. So I wanna give you a, a, a better picture of what each of the groups does. So um, the dance group here, uh, they again come Monday, Wednesday, Friday for an hour, and they work out with Ronnie and Chrysla. They wear a heart rate monitor during the sessions so that we can see their heart rate and make sure that they're in an aerobic zone. So these are just fake names, but Anthony here, we would tell him, um, we have a trainer present too, to make sure that everyone's in a safe heart rate zone, which we figure out by your fitness test. Um, and Anthony would have to slow down a little bit, whereas Brian here could probably work a little harder. And then all of these people here that are in orange are, are doing really well. And I'm just gonna, the best way to describe the dance classes is just to show you. So I'm gonna play a quick, clip. We have live music as well during the class. We have African drums and the dance classes over the six months. The dance classes over the six months are separated by region of Africa. So uh, our participants love learning different dances and hearing different music from, from different regions. The cultural immersion group uh, is also super fun and engaging and also led by Ronnie and Chrysla. And they do a bunch of things in this group. They do not dance. They don't do anything aerobic, but they do 
a bunch of educational activities. They do, they, they read books and watch movies together and have discussions. They do African crafts. Um, again, it's kind of organized by region. So throughout the six months, uh, there's kind of a unit uh, for each region of Africa. And the, the by far the most popular section of this class is the cooking class uh, where Ronnie is quite the chef and uh, they cook traditional African food and they talk about um, where those meals came from and, and the regions. So both classes are a ton of fun and participants really enjoy it. So to date, we are in year four of a five-year grant. We've had 68 people randomized and 48 have already gone all the way through the intervention and completed everything. And we actually, because of COVID, we plan to continue recruiting um, well past our five-year limit here. So for another 18 months or so. Uh, so we are we actually still open for recruitment in the study. And as a little spoiler, so I don't know the group assignments at all. So we are blinded to what groups participants are in. So we can't really say what is driving this, but right now we are actually seeing from pre to post interventions, we're seeing improvements in a measure of overall neurocognitive function, um, as well as several subtests, including memory, which is something that everyone wants to, wants to keep sharp. So again, we don't know what groups this is. This could be both groups. This could be one group more than the other, uh, but we are seeing um, effects in the predicted direction. So some general take homes here are that black Americans are at increased risk of experiencing neurocognitive decline with age. We know aerobic exercise can improve neurocognitive health, but minorities are very underrepresented in existing clinical research. And we have also now have evidence that engaging forms of exercise like African dance are effective at improving neurocognitive function in underrepresented groups. And having this community setting seems to be uh, more accepted and more convenient for engaging underrepresented populations in, in this type of research. So we're really excited about, about this model and, and continuing to scale it further. So as a little bonus section here, um, I added um, a little bit about what you can do to preserve your own brain health. So uh, exercise may not be the number one thing that people want to change personally, uh, but there is a menu of, of behaviors that have some evidence behind them for, for promoting and preserving brain health. Uh, so you can choose one or more of these to focus on, and all of them honestly will um, reduce your risk. And the more that you can do, the probably the more you're going to be able to reduce your risk of, of unwanted cognitive changes. And then finally, another thing you can do is consider participating in research. So I put a link to, there's tons of research going on at the ADRC. Um, I put a link to our research group here uh, with current projects that are, that are enrolling. And the REACT study that I talked about, as I mentioned, is still enrolling. So I put the number there too, if anyone is interested in that particular study. Um, but you might see benefits to yourself in the short term, but participating in research is really the way that we uh, make sure that future generations don't have to live with diseases like Alzheimer's um, that we are living with right now. So thank you so much for your attention. Uh, I would love uh, to answer any questions or um, have a discussion on this. Wonderful, thank you so much, Dr. Stillman. Uh, we're, we're really fortunate to um, hear this directly from you and hear the current state of the science. I know we have uh, one question already in the Q&A feature, let me actually, it looks like two now. So let me just tell everyone, um, if you look at the bottom of your screen on Zoom, you will see um, a little uh, option that you can click that says Q and A. And if you click on that, you can type your question for Dr. Stillman in there and um, I will pose these questions to her. So we'll get started with um, one. What is the age eligibility for the REACT study? Yeah, absolutely. I kind of glazed over that. Uh, the ages that we're looking for are 60 to 80 years old uh, for, this, for this study. And we also have other studies going on that accept younger ages, but this is the, that's the age range for the REACT study in particular. Great, thank you. Um, another question is, are participants compensated? Can you tell us about yeah. that? 
Yeah, great question. Yes, yes, we are so grateful to our participants for um, for taking the time to participate in research. We do compensate for all of the um, each of the baseline sessions. So we have like a I can't remember off the top of my head. It's something like eighty dollars for their MRI, twenty five for a cognitive session, um, and um, additional for blood and actigraphy wearing. Um, and we do that before and after. So there's two sessions before and then two sessions at follow-up. And then we give um, attendance bonuses. So we don't pay for classes, uh, but we do give attendance bonuses to anyone that participates in at least 80% of, of the classes. That's really interesting. That's a, just from a scientific perspective, that's a great and rewarding way for participants too to, to improve um, staying in the study. So neat idea. Um, so there's another question about, do participants stay in the study the whole time? And I'm not quite clear on exactly what that means. So Uchenna, if you wanna, um, if you wanna type that out a little bit more, I'm happy to um, clarify a little bit. But um, I think it might be getting at perhaps the time commitment with the yeah. study. So can you comment a little bit more on, you know, what's the time for each session for the participant to come in and participate in a class? And it sounds like the, the intervention period is for six months. So maybe you yeah, can just exactly. tell us a little bit more about the time element. Yeah, exactly. So yes, there, there is um, quite a time commitment here. What we're trying to do, what we hope is that we're trying to um, work physical activity into our participants' lives so that they hopefully after the intervention have community connections and workout buddies maybe even um, to continue doing this. So it is an hour, three times per week. Um, there's a morning class and an afternoon class uh, and it's Monday, Wednesdays and Fridays is, are the days that um, we're able to have classes. Um, and yes, yeah, so there's a morning option and um, an afternoon option as well. And the assessments that, that occur at baseline and at follow-up, uh, they take anywhere from one to two hours for each. So there involves two visits to Oakland and we pay for parking and everything like that, or reimburse for buses. Um, and then the rest can be done remotely. Uh, so it is, it is a time commitment, particularly since some people in that lower age range might still be working. Yeah, I think the idea of building up a habit like that is is kind of interesting. I wonder if you hear from any of your participants who have completed the study and if you can if you plan to have any kind of longer term ongoing follow up, even though that technically they're done with that intervention phase. Ah, I'm so glad, Beth, you read my mind. Yes, <laughs> we do. So our participants, the number one complaint is that the intervention is too short. So it seems like a huge commitment when they start and then it becomes kind of part of their life and they, they're coming to these classes they're getting to know their their peers in the classes um, we've had people form their own continuation groups after the pilot for example and um, some of the earlier cohorts of the current trial uh, have told us that they are continuing to meet together and either uh, keep doing these cooking the cooking classes that they learned, the cooking techniques that they learned, or if they're in the dance group, they're continuing to try to keep up with, um, with that. Um, and we, we actually just got funded to follow up on these participants. So great news. About, yeah. So about 18 months after participating in the react trial participants will get a call and it's completely voluntary if they want to, but it'll be a one session follow up where uh, they would be compensated again, but we were we were interested to see how long these benefits last potentially. Um, so that's one of the things that we don't know yet in research is once you stop this intervention, how long do these brain and cognitive changes, how long are they maintained? Uh, and do people maintain the increase in physical activity or um, uh, even social connection after the intervention? So yeah, there's a lot of research underway on that. Uh, and I see that uh, Ms. Terry has her hand raised so politely. Go ahead. You are welcome to interrupt me at any time and ask a question. No, thank you very much. <clears throat> Excuse me. I did have a question for you, and um, I may have missed this, but I just wanted to know what um, process or procedures do you have 
after participants have been a part of the study, do you give uh, feedback or information back to the community? How, community? How, do you, how do you do that or have you guys implemented that into your study? That's a great question. Yes. So for privacy reasons, we can never release individual information, but what we do like to do is when there's a publication, which generally they, they take a while, we have to wait for the, for the study to be done before we can release them, but we, we will circulate that to anyone that's indicated they would like that, um, any participants, so they can see at a group level what the results of the study were. Um, and of course, during the baseline sessions, um, if people have, for example, hypertension that they didn't know about, we are obligated to let them know that as well. So we're not clinicians, but uh, we can refer to clinicians or we can refer people to go see their PCP if there's anything that looks alarming um, from that. And sometimes that does happen. So as I mentioned, the actually the rate of hypertension is actually very high for older adults in the US right now. So we have had quite a few people that didn't even know that they were extremely, had a really, really high blood pressure and we were, actually able to get them under control and they, they come back into the study after. So. so there are instances where people can learn something about themselves individually, but our goal is to release it at the group level uh, so that yeah. people can see the results of the study aggregated. Yeah, that would be good. I know oftentimes there are uh, community members participate in studies yeah. and then a lot of times there's no follow-up on, you know, their you know, their participation. So I was just wondering if you had a component of that in your study. And if not, that's a that would be a great yeah, yeah, that's such a great point. And I, I feel like uh, COVID ruined this a little bit, but we had also built into this grant, the idea of having reunions. So because everyone gets so close during the study, they're with each other for six months. Um, every, every six months, we wanted to have a, a reunion for the five years of the study. Uh, we've had to put that on pause, but we hope to be able to resume those as well. So it's, yeah, it's really great to see communities forming um, from people in our studies. Great. And can I ask just briefly while we're on the topic of COVID, how did you adapt to COVID? Did you have to pause inter the intervention and assessments briefly? Um, did you follow up with people more by phone? Yeah, so it was very challenging given that we were working with older adults and we were working in a group setting doing exercise. So <laughs> we kind of got really, really hit hard by COVID. So we did what we did with the current people that were enrolled in the trial when COVID hit us, um, when the lockdowns hit us, we didn't have things like vaccines where we did everything online. So Chrysala quickly was able to upload dance videos to YouTube and we helped people. We kind of served as uh, IT specialists too, and we helped people. Um, they weren't familiar with YouTube. We helped them um, get set up. The only thing we couldn't do was the heart rate monitors. So we lost a little bit of information on how rigorous our intervention was um, during COVID and we stopped enrollment for a good year. Uh, but we are back up and running now. Everything is in person. Um, our instructors are still masking. And I believe our participants are, many of them are choosing to still mask as well. So we're trying to keep this a very tight and safe environment um, for our, our participants. Is there a cap on the attendance? Like how many people are in a class at a given time? Yeah, so we did say that, um, so we have, let's see, we have two of each class available running at any time. And we did say that we'd have 20 as our limit, but we have not reached that yet. So there's there's still plenty of room. COVID, we lowered that a little bit. So we had um, we had about 12 people being our max based on the square footage of the rooms that we use. Uh, and we have not hit that. So it, it turns out that you get a lot of indiv individualized attention. It's still group format, but um, they're not big classes. They're pretty, they're pretty small and manageable. And let me just um, open it up back to everybody else for one last question. I see we're at the, at the end of our time together. Um, just wanna ask whether any of our attendees have any other Q&A to put in the Q&A or Melita, whether you have anything else that you would like to add? No, th I just want to say thank you so much, uh, Dr. Stillman, for um, a wonderful presentation on 
uh, the REACT study and um, information that can certainly help the community in um, promoting healthy, healthy brain aging, I should say. And um, I, I, I personally have heard about your study um, just being okay. in the community and, you know, um, I've heard some people say that they are uh, participating in how much they truly enjoy. Um, oh, good. That's great to hear. Yeah. yeah, the the African dance component of the um, of the study. So I just wanted to um, say thank you so much for uh, sharing with us, giving us uh, an hour out of your day. And I also want to extend a thank you to uh, Walter Allen's daughter, Dr. Dorothy, I mean, Dr. Mrs. Dorothy Allen Merchant for being with us today and other family members if they are still here. And Beth, thank you as well for doing a fantastic job facilitating. And I would like to wish everyone at the, a happy rest of your afternoon. Thanks for attending everyone. See you Thanks, next everyone. time. Thanks for attending. Have a great day. Bye.